Anyway, uh, Andrew Christie here to $20, man. Thank you so much, Andrew. Says here, where do you think indie filmmaking is going? I think blockbuster level filmmaking is at the hands of amazingly talented people very soon. Unreal Engine 5 and Blender being an example, just need the talent and stories. So, you know, I like indie filmmaking, like look at, look, okay, Nomadland won Best Picture. It's a fucking indie movie, dude. It's a fucking indie movie about, about a, uh, you know, about a woman who loses her job, buys a van, moves into it down by the river, and then gets a seasonal job working at fucking Amazon. It is very reflective of like a lot of YouTube videos that I watch from people who live in their vans, because I actually happen to like that kind of content. So color me surprised when it won, the topic won Best Picture. Indie filmmaking is always going to be about the personalized story. Blockbuster filmmaking is is where we're going in the future is going to be more or less all about tentpole. However, with Unreal Engine 5 and Blender and those costs minimizing, because studios like Blur Studios, led by Tim Miller, and others can do a really good job for like a pretty decent amount of money. And with a skillful enough filmmaker trying to tell some stories where they use that kind of technology as as like garnish for the dish and not the whole damn meal, you can get a lot out of a very minimal budget. The thing is, though, is that a lot of these studios, they don't they 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 are so worried about tentpole only. Remember Paramount Vantage? Uh, was it like Warner Independent? Sony Pictures Classics? Right? Like Lionsgate even had a, a, an indie label. I forget what it was called, but they had indie, Fox Searchlight, by the way. Indie label, 20, 20 to $30 million mid budget range movies, lower to mid budget range movies. Lionsgate had a program where they were going to give 10 filmmakers a million dollars a year and have million dollar movies come out. $10 million made movies, budgeted movies. One of those movies hits, it pays for all the rest. Filmmakers can tell the good stories and there's a lot of good stories out there to be told and there's a lot of great people out there wanting to tell them. The problem though, and this is what Donald Glover was absolutely right about when he tweeted out that these shows and these movies are afraid to do anything different because they're afraid of getting canceled. And it's not, that's not a cancel culture thing. That's just the reality of the world we live in, you know? And I talk about, and, I, and I've mentioned this before, there's a big problem in regards to cancel culture and how it affects us mentally and emotionally and physically. And yes, physically. When you have a show, and this is this is why, by the way, people run to the binge culture that uh, that Netflix does, because Netflix is responding to psychological trauma. Yes, and I'm using these terms. Actual PTSD that movie and television fans have experienced for decades. Let me explain. I know it's kind of a tough call. So here's what's going on with that. When you lose a family member or a dog or a pet or a friend or something that is of inherent value to you, it raises your cortisol levels, meaning you feel actual physical pain because those cortisol levels rise and you are having an honest reaction to this particular emotion how that translates over to books and comics and television and video games and movies is we form connections and bonds with these characters, with these actors in these roles. And when you feel, and I'm telling you, this actually really negatively impacted The Walking Dead quite a bit. So when you build up an affinity with these characters and the characters go season to season or movie to movie, and they build that relationship with the audience. And then those characters are suddenly taken away. Whether the film series doesn't make as much as they need to make to warrant financing another one or a television show doesn't hit the numbers it needs to hit in order to warrant continuing the seasons. The audience reacts to that. The viewer reacts to that because all of a sudden this story, this world, these characters, these actors that they are emotionally and mentally connected to are gone without any explanation. Suddenly, just like that, drop dead. Just like what happened with your dog when it was hit by a car. You all of a sudden start feeling actual, real, physical pain as a direct result of cortisol levels rising. And this is what happens. 
And this is why people are furious at these networks for canceling things because they get invested and then it gets taken away. Now, if you want to hear me out on this one, go back and find Family Guy, uh, the very first episode when it came back from being canceled in 2005. Peter goes on like a 90 second rant about listing every single canceled show on Fox from when Family Guy was canceled in the early 2000s to when it was brought back. Every single show canceled. That is exactly what he did. He, he listed every single one. And so as a result of that, what you got is like, it, it brought back all these memories shows. I loved that were canceled very quickly. And you know what? They were making a joke about Fox. Even Futurama did the same thing when comedy central brought them back. They made fun about Fox's executives because these, there was even, there's, even, there's a show by the way on Fox to give you an example of how bad Fox was during that time. The show was called drive. Okay. And it starred Nathan Fillion. It starred Emma stone and a bunch of other people. Okay. And the whole point was more or less like a, a mad dash across the country, uh, trying to solve clues and stuff because some shadowy people are like offering up a big prize and people need the money or something. Right. It was an interesting concept. Fox aired it on a Sunday night. They aired episode one and, and then the next night on Monday, which was going to be the uh, the actual, uh, you know, broadcast night, they showed episode two. The following Monday, they showed episode three. Tuesday, they canceled the show. They canceled the show. Three episodes canceled the show. Big name talent in it. Still canceled the show. Because to them, it's a business. It's all a business. It's always been a business. And they're never going to stop treating it like that. The problem, though, is that that business has an actual emotional, physical cost to the audience. Do you want to understand why the Marvel Cinematic Universe is as popular as it is, as profitable as it is, and why people are as loyal to it as they are? Because Kevin Feige understands the key principle of keeping your audience not only engaged, but allowing the characters to grow with the audience and vice versa to allow the characters and the actors to continuously play these roles for a decade or more. And in that builds loyalty. It builds camaraderie. It builds a fan base that will follow you literally to the end of time, because guess what? You don't treat them like a redheaded stepchild and beat them every time something doesn't go the way you want instantaneously. That is the problem with current television. That is why Netflix is as popular as a binge culture because it is dealing with the systemic damage that network television has put on its viewers for literal decades.